Hey scholars, welcome to chapter 17.5, the last section of chapter 17, where we're looking at how do we actually perceive risks and how can we avoid the worst of them. Now that we've seen the different types of risk, you know, biological, um, chemical, you know, physical, all these types of risks, you know, now that we've seen those, how do we actually avoid the worst of those? So we can do this by, again, becoming more informed, thinking about our decisions in life and making really, really careful choices. Um, and we all t we talk about this and we call this risk analysis, where we actually identify hazards, evaluate and kind of rank each risk that we take, and make decisions to lessen the impact or eliminate that risk altogether if it's very, very um, hazardous to our health. Um, the three greatest health risks that the book talks about and that I really want you to know for the quiz, hint, hint, are the first one being poverty. That is the largest health risk. The second one is gender, or in this case, being born a male. It brings, it, you know, brings your life expectancy down. And the third one is your lifestyle choices. How do you actually live your life? What kind of things do you expose yourself to? And, uh, and, and those are our three greatest health risks as humans. Um, this just shows you a couple of different, uh, the high risk health problems, you know, indoor air pollution, outdoor air pollution, working be workers being exposed to industrial or farm chemicals, pesticide residues. Um, and then these are high risk ecological problems. We'll stay with the high health risks since that's what we're on. But global climate change, stratospheric ozone depletion, wildlife habitat destruction, and species extinction. Medium risk for ecological problems are acid rain, pesticides, airborne. They can cause some of these major problems. And even low risk, even oil spills. Now it seems like a low, like that's a pretty big deal. But it's easily cleaned up, well, for the most part, compared to some of these medium or high risks. Groundwater pollution, radioactivity, isotopes, um, you know, like uh, radon underneath your house, uh, acid runoff or surface water, thermal pollution, those are all low risk problems. This is just a, a global outlook at the number of deaths per year from different various causes. Obviously, we talk about poverty being the, the worst of them all, uh, with malnutrition, diseases kind of linked to poverty, 11 million deaths annually. Um, tobacco is the next one with 5.4 million, um, and again, that's a preventable one. Pneumonia and flu, 3.2 million that die for, uh, a year. Um, air pollution caused ones, 3 million. HIV AIDS, 2.1 million. Diarrheal diseases, 1.9. TB or tuberculosis, 1.7 million deaths per year. Automobile accidents, 1.2. Worker-related injuries, 1.1. Malaria, 1 million. Hep B, 1 million. And measles, 800,000. So those are kind of your, your top, uh, top causes of death annually uh, per year. This is uh, looking at Worldometer. This is an interesting. I'm not going to go to this website and show you, but I want you to take a look at it if you'd like to. And then tell me what stats stood out to you the most. And I'll give you a bonus stamp if you're the first person to come in from your class to do that. If it's www.worldometers.info, it's a whole bunch of running stats um, in live time of what's going on around the world, especially hazards to our health, human population, a number of different things bought and sold. So take a look at that and then come back to me. If you're the first person that gives me your most interesting stat that you saw that was really stood out to you, I'll give you a bonus stamp. Um, other comparisons of risks, this is kind of looking at life expectancy, how much they shorten our average life expectancy. And poverty, again, is the worst, 7 to 10 years. Being born a male, because males live about 7.5 years less than females, is, is I guess, a hazard. Uh, smoking, 6 to 10 uh, years. Um, being overweight, it reduces 6 years of your life. If you're unmarried, because you're living a more risque lifestyle, 5 years. Um, again, uh, obesity by 15% only, uh, only takes away two years of your life. If your spouse smokes and you're, and you're living in that environment with a secondhand smoke, that loose, reduces your lifespan by one year, and then it goes on and on all the way down. I'm not going to go into all them, but those are very interesting ones, I guess, in the top um, 10 or so. Um, one of the case studies is death from smoking. It is one of the most preventable major causes of suffering and premature death. Unfortunately, it greatly affects our human population today. Um, uh, nicotine, because mostly of nicotine and the additive of, of, of keeping us hooked on uh, smoking. But there are lots of effects of passive smoking. Almost as bad as first-hand smoke and actually smoking yourself. Secondhand smoke does kill, and we've, we've definitely proven that a number of times. Um, children are at a greater risk of allergies and asthma when they're exposed to, when they're exposed to smoke. Even, um, even if you're a person who is a female who is pregnant and isn't smoking, but you're around a smoking environment, that can be very damaging to your baby as well. Um, 46,000 heart diseases and deaths per year because of, of, uh, because of smoking as well. So there is a lot of problems with it, and it's one of the most preventable methods there. How should we reduce smoking as a, a culture? If we tax it more, it's going to cost more. If we, we, put it ban we ban it in places, like in public places, like bars and things like that, which a lot of people are, are grateful for. Um, classify and regulate nicotine as an illegal drug might obviously stop it, or maybe it'll just cause people to rebel even more. Who knows? And just education. We, we, we educate a lot about it, but 
just continue to educate people that might, might help as well. Those are our, our main things that might help us reduce uh, smoking in the United States and also worldwide. Um, this is annual deaths just in the U.S. Of t from tobacco use and other causes in 2004. So you can see the difference. This is 2004. It's one year. But look how much more the deaths are from tobacco use than the next highs, which is just plain old accidents or mostly auto accidents. So just looking at that difference is huge. I mean, this is this can definitely be cut down. And imagine if tobacco was never, in, you know, never thought up or, you know, as far as as far as health wise, I mean, I know financially it, it it builds a lot of economies, but. As far as if it was never bought and, and paid for and, and used, how many more people we, we had on the planet? Maybe, that, maybe that's another checks and balances things that we need to talk about again. Um, system reliability. This is looking at estimating risk from technology, like in Chernobyl. You know, the human error is always 75%. When, we, when, we, when we're estimating um, you know, human error, it's always 75%. So even if we had a technological reliability of 100%, if we multiply 100% by the 75%, we're still going to get a, maybe about 75, 80% as far as uh, overall error. And so Chernobyl was obviously mostly human error, but even with, there is, there is, there's no ever, it's never a system that's 100% reliable, mostly because of humans, especially with technology. Um, most people don't really know how to evaluate risks. I know a lot of you, and we're going to talk about this and do a little survey, but most of you don't know um, how to really evaluate risks because of fear. Most of you fear things like I am, I'll say it, I'm a fear, afraid of horses. So obviously that probably risk is not very high, but I feel like it's one of the highest because I'm, I fear it. Um, there is a degree of some people evaluate risk because based on their degree of control, like a lot of people risk, you know, fear flying and, and, you know, they don't evaluate risk properly because of their fear of flying because they don't, they're not in charge of actually driving the plane, right? So the degree, the degree of control comes into play. Whether a risk is catastrophic, we fear catastrophes more than chronic problems. So some of you mo might, might fear being struck by lightning more than dying from cancer from cigarette smoke. I mean, it's just kind of we, we fear catastrophe or hurricanes, death by tornado, um, you know, more than chronic problems. We also have that optimism bias that ah, it's not going to happen to me. You know, we always think that in our minds that can't happen to me. It won't ever happen. We also really, really like instant gratification. So even if something is really dangerous and has a high risk value, we might still want to do it because it's got an instant gratification, like cigarette smoking. It's a chronic problem. People like the instant gratification of smoking a cigarette. Or bungee jumping could have a high risk value. Because of that excitement value, it's instant, grat instant gratification, we still want to do it and really don't, really don't consider it as big of a risk. Uh, also, there's an unfair distribution of risks as well. People see scientific decisions as political. So a lot of people would say like, Oh, you know, like you shouldn't smoke. And that's you know, even though science says this, we're probably trying to support politics and trying to it has something to do with politics and whatnot. So there's a lot of unfair distributions of risk as well. So uh, several principles can help us. This is our last thing, which chapter 17 today is the first thing you do is compare risks. Actually, take a look at your lifestyle, things in your life, and compare those risks to one another. Determine how much your ri risk you're willing to accept as far as your lifestyle choices, and then determine that actual risk involved, and then concentrate on evaluating and carefully making better life choices that might lower that risk to allow you to live a longer lifespan. All right, hopefully this has been an enlightening uh, chapter on chapter 17 on your own human health and how the environment relates to us as well. And we'll see you guys next time for chapter 18 and air pollution.